Good morning, everyone. I'm going to have my panelists come up here, and you have to guess who's at Visa, who's at Tesla, and who's at Levi's, OK? So we'll figure it out. So last time I was here, some of you might remember, I was uh, interviewing, or rather grilling, Preet Bharara on stage a couple of years ago. So compared to that, this is a piece of cake today. Exactly. So we have three amazing CFOs. And when we discussed the session, I said, we've got to get non-technical folks into the Thai fold. And what better than to have three great CFOs from three amazing companies. We had a half hour meet right before this. One of them was trying to sell me a new pair of jeans. Another one wanted to sell me a Tesla. And the third one was giving me a free debit card. So. <laughs> Gosh, you guys are pretty good salesmen, too. So I want to start off the session by uh, asking the three panelists. Of course, we have next to me is Vasant Prabhu with Visa, Harmeet Singh with Levi's, and Deepa Kahuja with Tesla. I just want to say, uh, just hear their journey a little bit. Uh, how did they become a CFO? It's very different than all of you in the room, primarily who are entrepreneurs and tech folks. You know, Maybe they can spend a minute each just talking about how did they get to be a CFO? Um, I'd say I'm an accidental CFO. Um, started uh, with the typical Indian career of either choosing between medicine and engineering. Landed up with engineering. Um, came to the US, worked as an engineer for several years, and accidentally did an MBA and switched to uh, finance. Um, and, and before I knew it, I'd, I had sufficient experience in different parts of the business and operations that. Uh, set me up well to uh, take on a CFO role. So accidentally, here I am. <laughs> Harmeet? Yeah, um, so um, you know, I, I educated myself in India. And uh, I think it was uh, in grade 10, you've got to fork out your career between science and commerce. Uh, you know, you've got to decide that early. So I decided I'll take commerce um, and did my chartered accountancy uh, from India. And then you know, started working in different companies and uh, not realizing that, or didn't have the ambitious, ambition to be a CFO. But my career went down the finance path. And uh, you know, I worked for great brands like American Express, Pepsi, Yum, Hyatt, and now uh, Levi's. And uh, I probably became CFO of the first division about 20 years ago. And uh, you know, since then, I've been lucky enough to be CFO of some large, uh, great corporations around the US. Thanks, Harmeet. Basan? Yeah, I'm, I'm also an engineer who lost his way, like you. Um, <laughs> On the dark side, huh? Yeah, exactly. Switched over. Um, yeah, I was an engineer, but I knew when I was an engineer that I liked business better than engineering, so I did not practice as an engineer, even for a single day. But then I wasn't a CFO either. I have no background in accounting or finance. And somewhere along the way, somebody took a risk on me, which was a very big risk, and put me in a CFO job. And that's what I ended up doing. I must say, most finance people don't take this route. They're actually qualified finance people. <laughs> <laughs> So hopefully this is not uh, broadcast, because these are secrets Deepak and I would like to keep to ourselves. <laughs> so I promised one of the CFOs here we wouldn't talk about fluffer bots, OK? No, no fluffer bots today, but we'll, we'll keep on track here. So one of the things that would be nice to, for the audience to understand is, what is the computing environment? What's the digital strategy of these three great brands that you guys represent? Uh, so maybe, Vasant, you can talk. I know you've already been a digital company right from day one, but what does the environment look like? Yeah, I mean, if you think about Visa, we were digital before the word digital was even fashionable. So for those of you who don't know, Visa is actually a Bay Area company from over 60 years ago that started digitizing cash. Started in Stockton, California, actually. Um, and we've been digitizing cash ever since. And in the early days, it used to be called electronic, not digital. And so we were electronic payments, now we're digital payments. And, and along the way, of course, there's been a massive transformation. And today is probably the most exciting time, even in our 60-year history, because it has become so much easier and cheaper to digitize cash. Um, 
all the way from, if you might remember, people used to take an impression of your card to swiping a card, to dipping a card, to tapping a card, and then e-commerce comes in. And without someone like us, you couldn't do e-commerce, as you know, if you didn't have a way to pay digitally. Uh, and today, I mean, it's just an extraordinary time because every smart device is a way to pay or be paid. Um, so uh, our job right now is to find every which way people are coming up to be paid and pay and find a way to get them on our network because you know we have, we think, the most secure, the most reliable, and the one that goes to the most places. Yeah, I have a new product idea for you. Just implant a chip in every boy and it's girl coming. that's born. It's yeah. coming. <laughs> yeah. We're now, I mean, that's the next thing coming. Is It's true. I mean, yeah. we already, if you were at the Winter Olympics in Seoul, for example, it was totally, totally contactless. People were using rings. Um, you know, everybody was given um, something or the other that they could use to pay. Uh, it was in gloves. Um, so that day is coming, and we would love to implant a chip in everybody. <laughs> Just walk through, <laughs> walk through uh, every payment aisle. I, I know, Harmit, you've already done this with clothing, right? Yeah. The, um, so, you know, digital transformation is um, actually changing the way and disrupting the retail world big time. Uh, so as we think about, in, you know, being with Levi's, which is a 160-year-old company, we actually call it a 160-year-old startup because we're really thinking about this very differently. It starts with technology innovation and actually our products, as you said. I'm wearing a uh, you know, um, trucker jacket called Jacquard. We launched this in partnership with Google. It actually has... Um, technology woven into the fabric, you know, so I can, for example, ask, you know, I can access time, I can access music, but just a flip of a hand or directions. Um, so that's one piece, piece of it. The second is uh, we have just um, announced uh, the introduction or use uh, through software, uh, which is patented by us and developed uh, by us, um, uh, where we can use lasers to finish our product. And basically what it does is, instead of um, you know, a, a, a gene or, or a pan being uh, finished in 20 minutes, laser can do it in 90 seconds. Uh, and so that's something we're pioneering in the field of technology. So that's the product side, because we think that's important. It's also, MR, I know you're a big believer of sustainability. This uh, is a big uh, uh, drive for us, uh, because we're getting rid of thousands of chemicals to a few. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is, uh, you know, which is close to my heart, which is the, uh, the automation of, uh, you know, our processes. Um, you know, for that, we are in introducing bots, um, whether it's in the finance world, whether it is in the, in the world of transactions, in, you know, whether it's customer service or, or data centers, we're really taking that on. And the last piece uh, is data mining. Uh, really, that's where we, you know, we have a lot of data, you know, being around for such a long time, like in, the, in Wasan's world. The question is, how do you use the data? How do you mine the data? And um, that's something we're really working on. And we're actually partnering with a few startups. Uh, that, that's the capability we don't necessarily have in our DNA. My CIO is here. You know, he, uh, he and I are kind of working through that uh, with the organization. So a lot of work in terms of uh, how we are uh, looking at the digital space and how do you leverage that to actually make it a competitive advantage. So Deepak, uh, I know in your case, you've written software, you partner with companies. What does what the IT and digital environment look like? Yeah, for us, um, the, the systems and uh, applications underlying uh, every aspect of our business, uh, we, we look at them as a core strategy um, to enable our broader vision of um, accelerating the world's uh, transition to sustainable energy. A and we look at all of these with a first principles perspective uh, to see whether they are going to enable us to interact with our customers in a very different manner uh, compared to the other companies. Um, and so we spend a lot of bandwidth, a lot of time in developing the right applications that enable us to succeed in that vision. Uh, so that's one aspect. And the other aspect is we are growing 
um, historically at about 70 to 80 percent um, annual uh, top line uh, revenue increase. And uh, so our business is scaling extremely fast. We simply can't hire people at that linear rate uh, to grow with the business, which means that we are, and I personally end up spending a lot of time um, uh, at transforming our processes, simplifying, automating, coming up with new applications that enable us to go on this full digital journey right from the point a customer interacts through all the, the ripple effect of systems, manufacturing, engineering, supply chain, financial, uh, so that we have um, a scalable business at the end of the day. So let's move to one of the hot topics at this conference, which is artificial intelligence. Uh, so can, can you talk a little bit in more detail about how AI is being used in your companies? I know with Visa, every time I go to a foreign country and I use my card, it gets a fraud detection uh -oh. message shows up. Uh, so I mean, what, what about you? <laughs> maybe it's me, I don't know. Uh, but uh, what, what are the kinds of uh, usage of AI in your companies look like? Yeah, you hit on one. I mean, the, the most obvious use uh, is to reduce fraud. I mean, clearly, uh, the use of data. So within milliseconds, decisions have to be made about whether that transaction is a fraudulent transaction or a good transaction. And so we use a lot of data and AI uh, to make those kinds of decisions and uh, accept or not accept. A corollary to that is the nuisance, as you know. If you go somewhere and you're legitimate, uh, it's a legitimate transaction. If it's rejected, you're very upset. So we have to reduce the rate at which there are false negatives. In other words, it's MR. Obviously, MR should be trusted. He shouldn't be rejected at any time. 100% of his transaction should go through. There again, you know, there's a lot of technology we're using, and it's getting better every day to reduce the false negatives. Um, and then beyond that is, I think, the new revolution coming where uh, you use data for authentication. So today, as you know, um, you don't want any friction in the transaction where you have to put in a password or any other way to identify yourself. Uh, over time, hopefully, you'll get to a point where we can do it behind the scenes, where we don't need you to authenticate in any way, whether it's biometric or otherwise. But those are some of the big applications. Then there's many other applications. We work with merchants to help them target. And then, of course, in our behind the scenes, in our back office systems, we're starting to explore you know, AI bots for improving our controls and you know, auditing and those kinds of things. So it's all over the place. Great. Yeah, uh, uh, in our case, uh, we start, again, I think as both Deepak and Vasant have said, it's across the, uh, the chain, starting with the consumer. Um, you know, we've just, a lot of our, the consumers, and most of you here, first go to um, go online and check out you know, different products and apparel. So we've introduced um, a, a virtual stylist um, where you interact uh, uh, with the machine and you know, using AI and bots, you're able to um, you explain what can be styled uh, for you, what's the best, uh, you know, what makes you look great. Uh, the second piece is, um, again, I talked about the FLX uh, project, which is using la lasers. We're using AI to optimize the different kind of fits and finishes. And probably that's how I get you into a pair of jeans at some stage, uh, MR. Uh, so that's in the front end. And then in the back end, um, using the data, we're using AI to really mine the data, uh, whether it is using it for cybersecurity defense, both proactively or um, reactively, whether it is really thinking through efficiencies in supply chain management, whether it is thinking through what you take to market. And obviously, you know, um, there are the bots uh, which we're introducing to try and um, basically take over what I call grunt transactional work and get the workforce to focus on, you know, more value added work, which is analysis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we're thinking through it. Um, we haven't cracked it, um, you know, let me be uh, honest with you guys, but we're on the journey and I think it's here to stay. Great. 
Uh, how about you, Deepak? I know Fluffer Bots is one of the bots you guys have developed, but anything else? <laughs> well, I, I think what Vasantar uh, described here is completely relevant for Tesla, too, in terms of both uh, cybersecurity and fraud aspects, as well as uh, automation in um, all the various downstream systems. I think for Tesla, the other unique piece is the, the use of intensive AI and autopilot um, and in autonomous uh, driving. Uh, there's clearly a lot of machine learning there, a uh, lot of uh, neural net capabilities required um, with the amount of data that's coming and how do you uh, try and learn from it as soon as you can, a lot of uh, image processing that happens with it. So clearly, uh, in so many parts of our business, AI, is integral to our future success. Great. So let's move on to the other hot topic here is uh, crypto. So questions, uh, I know you might be able to supply cryptocurrency, of us, but can I buy a pair of jeans or a Tesla using Bitcoin or anything like that? No, I mean, you can't uh, today. Um, and to be honest, we're not leading the thinking there. We're going to be uh, the followers who are waiting for folks to think about. But we're thinking about things like blockchain, and we can talk about that separately because I think that's more relevant right now. Yeah, I'd say the same thing for us. Uh, I mean, for me, blockchain seems to have a lot of promise, and it feels like a, it's, a, it's a new kind of a paintbrush to, to create a new painting. And uh, it's a tool we need to learn in, in over time and create some beautiful paintings. Uh, but it'll take us a little bit of time with a lot of promise. Vasant, how about crypto? Is this, uh, how do you guys view cryptocurrencies? Well, when you, when you use the word currency, right, yeah. it stands for something. It either has to be a medium of exchange or a store of value. So <clears throat> there are some practical technological problems that maybe people here are solving, which is the speed mm -hmm. is not fast enough. So, you know, paying with cash or a card happens in milliseconds and um, today the technology cannot process a crypto transaction with that kind of speed. Um, so speed is a real issue. And the second is, is just the cost, right? I mean, it costs uh, probably 100 times as much for a crypto transaction than a typical, let's say, Visa transaction. And it's just very energy intensive. So those are technological problems that have to be solved, which may be solved someday. Then you have the practical problem that you will have, Harmeet will have is, let's say he has a website that says it's you know $50 in dollars and X amount in crypto. If the currency is very volatile, um, how does he price in crypto? Does he change his prices by the second? And if you're a buyer, if you bought a pair of jeans in the morning and in the evening, the conversion to dollars was 20% different, how would you feel about it? So, I mean, you've got the whole volatility question. The store of value thing is a whole different argument. You know, that's, a, that's another potential sort of uh, approach to it, and that's, a, that's where you're trying to replace you know, gold as an alternative and all that, and you can talk about that for a long time. So I think, I think there's, it has to be tested through you know, various crises before you really know whether it can function as a currency. Great. Uh, let's move on to blockchain, because there was a startling survey that came out yesterday from Gartner Group. It said they interviewed, I think, uh, surveyed 3,000 CIOs, and they said 1% of them have actually implemented some blockchain application. It also said at the same time, 77% of CIOs couldn't find an application to implement. So it seems like blockchain seems to be way ahead of its time. So maybe we can spend some time exploring the use cases for blockchain within your enterprises. You know, what do you see the applications? Are you doing blockchain kind of uh, work in the company? Harmeet? Sure. I mean, you know, I have two folks here um, who work for Levi's um, who are actually pioneering in this. Chris Clark, our CIO, who reports into me, and then uh, Pawan, um, who is our uh, head of global business services, reporting into me. So, you know, with the two folks here um, and with members of the uh, executive team, what we're really thinking about the two applications. One is on sustainability. We are a big, um, they're a company that, you know, deeply believes in doing the right thing for the environment. And you know, as we think about blockchain, one of the applications we're thinking about is tracking the fibers that are used in our products so, and from a sustainable lens. So that's the first piece. 
The second is, you know, GBS is, um, is really looking after all the back of the house transactions in finance, IT, um, and customer service that Pawan looks at. What we're thinking of the application there is, how do you track transactions, um, especially with a focus on third party uh, vendors, because we have a lot of third party vendors. Uh, and the question is, just understanding the chain, whether it's a purchase order, it's an invoice, or a goods receipt, how do you really use blockchain? Um, so again, you know, we're probably in the 1% as in the survey, but I think in terms of knowledge, we're probably a little higher when, um, than what you talked about. But it's very infancy stage. And, um, so folks here, if they have any insights and learnings, we'd, you know, we'd love to understand that and see how to take this forward. Deepak? Uh, yeah, I mean, from my point of view, the, the attributes that uh, blockchain technology offers are, first, it's uh, secure and, and reduces fraud. Um, and, and secondly, it's um, uh, a single source of data that contains all the information you need on that transaction. So I, I clearly see a couple of uh, high potential applications in the long term. The first is our interaction with our suppliers. The, the invoices that we get, the, the requests for payments that we get can be super secure and avoids the issue of fraud. And there is a lot of fraud in that area. Uh, and, so, and, and not only do you then have incoming information which is secure, but then you're able to pay uh, your vendors um, in a secured manner. So you may use real currencies, you may use US dollars or any other currency, but you're doing it using blockchain technology to keep that transaction absolutely secure, and you know it's going to the right, um, uh, right party rather than to a fraudulent uh, person at the other end or an entity. So I think that's one major application. And then the second piece is in the accounting world. I think it truly enables us to simplify how accounting is done uh, and uh, really create error-proof and uh, single source of uh, full information transacted, uh, transacted in one location with blockchain. So, I, Vasant, I want to come to you now because one of the, uh, the downsides of traditional blockchain technology is it's compute intensive. You have to keep copies of the ledger and so on and so forth in so many locations. Uh, so the ideal thing would be to use less compute intensive ways to do blockchain. Any thoughts on how you guys are looking at that? Because the milliseconds is one yeah. and compute power is the other, right? Yeah, uh, we've been very interested in blockchain. I mean, blockchain is where we really think there's a lot of value and we've been looking at it for a very long time. I mean, at Visa, we do 100 billion transactions a year. So clearly for those 100 reasons, billion. 100 billion. Yeah. Um, so for those, that application, you know, you can't do it. But then there's a, if you have a, if you have high value, lower volume transactions, like what you said, uh, then it's much more applicable. And we call, you know, we, we refer to it more as distributed ledger technology. And we actually have a product today that is doing exactly what uh, Deepak said, which is uh, getting a lot of interest. It's in pilot stage, which is to do business to business payments uh, cross border. So it's exactly what you said. It offers much greater security, more immediacy, because existing methods are less secure and they take a long time. Um, so those kinds of applications are going to be, I think, the initial commercialized applications of blockchain, where the, the volume of the transactions, you don't, you don't need the same high volume, but the value is high, so the cost and the speed issues are not a problem. Great. So let, let's move on to other aspects of innovation. I know. Uh, that's a big thing for the attendees here is how do companies like Visa, Tesla, Levi's, how do you guys work with startups? Because there's a whole bunch of them here. Uh, so what is the mechanism within your companies? How do you view the white spaces where you build versus areas you buy stuff? Uh, who wants to start on that discussion? Deepak? Uh, at Tesla, we... Um uh, as I started, uh, you know, we, we look at um, software applications as a core competency, uh, which means that our, our inclination is that uh, in most cases, we tend to build um, these applications in-house. 
Uh, and, and the fundamental reason for that is we believe it gives us long-term uh, agility uh, in, in uh, adapting our systems to our continually changing needs and our scaling of the business rather than relying on a third party. Having said that, clearly uh, there are many um, uh, software applications where you need um, third party uh, uh, input uh, and, and, and third party applications, uh, whether it's on the infose infosec side, uh, whether it's some of the AI aspects, um, and also, um, in my mind, the, the biggest value add is in some really specialized um, knowledge that, that software provides, whether it's engineering capabilities, manufacturing, or financial. Uh, it's not just a software that's written smartly or, um, or, or uh, um, or, or, or has an application which sometimes combines um, uh, different points of view to give a bigger perspective. Um, I, I feel, we, we tend to believe that um, standardized tools are uh, a better solution often than uh, very specific applications, but clearly uh, we are continuing to work with startups in specific areas where we feel they bring incredible value. So yeah, those conversations continue. From our perspective, um, we view uh, technology as a key com competitive enabler to getting our products in the marketplace. Um, we are not a, a development, um, traditional technology development workshop uh, or, or a, co a company that has a lot of developers. Uh, we believe that we need to leverage the enterprise, uh, which is what's happening around us, um, where we think about building versus um, leveraging others. And you know, I'm a big believer of using third party uh, resources, whether it's intelligence, whether it's capability, whether it's dollars. Um, uh, so for us, what's proprietary is core to our DNA. So for example, in FLX, we have patented the software that actually um, helps uh, you know, drive you know, the lasers into a certain finish. Um, but in other cases, like the e-commerce example, where we have a virtual stylus, we are, we, we, we're, we're partnered with a startup. We partnered with Google for the Jacquard jacket, where technology was woven in the fabric. Uh, we are partnering with some um, uh, you know, startups um, on the AI, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we've got uh, an outsource partner who's helping us with bots. So again, our whole concept is what's proprietary, we, we like to keep inside what we can leverage from third parties. I think, uh, you know, it's the world of partnerships today, so it's important right. to leverage that. Hassan? Yeah, I think with large companies, uh, you know, if you're a startup, you have a better opportunity if you are selling something where the company itself wants to be on the cutting edge or innovate. So, for example, at Visa, if you have a new way to pay or to accept payments, we talk to lots of companies. Uh, we we want to get to you, you know, very fast and find a way to work with you so that we can help you do what you're trying to do. Uh, similarly, if it's cybersecurity, where, you know, we clearly want to be you know, on the cutting edge. We work with lots of startups. I think then if you go to companies like us where we are not that interested in innovating or we want just stability and, you know, uh, we're not really looking for, you know, a lot of cutting edge stuff, it's a little harder sell, I think. Um, so you, I think you have to find where the company is trying to innovate and really, uh, you know, differentiate itself. You have a better opportunity there. I think, Amar, I mean, my, advice to the folks in the room um, as they deal with at least um, companies like mine. A couple of things. One, know our business. I think uh, it's critical that you know our business. Uh, the second is, um, you know, the solution needs to be pragmatic and workable. So I mean, there has to be a use case that says, we've done it in the past, here are the results. And, you know, speaking for my fellow CFOs, uh, what we look at is 
clear value, either both in the short term as well as in the long term. And, and I think that makes it, because driving a competitor advantage, I think, is important. So how do you really think through that? I don't well, know if people can, Vasan, yeah. if you think about it differently, but you know, I just asked yeah. the question. Absolutely. So we're going to come to a close pretty soon. So any closing thoughts for entrepreneurs and founders in the audience in terms of uh, your words of wisdom in the financial space? In the financial space, um, I, I guess it's a pretty broad question. Um, uh, uh, what, what I would say is that, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, my, my background has not been uh, in the early stage startup, uh, and, and there are a lot of amazing um, uh, venture capitalists and uh, entrepreneurs sitting here who can give more advice there. Uh, but the only advice perhaps I can give is um, uh, you know, what's the right time to go public and uh, what do you go be, uh, do beyond that? And, and that, um, uh, for different companies, I would say there are different reasons for going public. Um, access to capital, um, uh, if, if it is not easily available in the private um, uh, investment world, is, in my mind, uh, the major reason why companies should go public. It's not really uh, to, um, to create, um, uh, to, to monetize the um, investment that uh, people have made. There are many other ways to sell a company or, or have, you know, I was just talking to Hermit, how well, as a private company, uh, your, your employees and um, investors can still see growth in their value without being a public company. And so there are a lot of benefits to that. And one has to be very clear about the reasons of when you go public or why. Um, and if, you don't, if you're not clear about it, and it's just about being, uh, you know, that's a really sexy thing to do or it's a very public thing to do, that's sometimes not a good enough reason. So having that clarity is super important. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, being a, a company that's been around for 160 years, uh, we all have legacy systems. Um, and uh, it's good and bad, okay? The, the good is you, you have an environment that you've grown up with. The bad is it's not keeping pace with whatever is happening in terms of innovation around, around you. And the question is how can you help us leverage the, the transformation that's happening in terms of uh, technology without uh, causing me to build interfaces with my wonderful legacy systems, which are expensive. Um, you know, so I think that's the thing that I would um, you know, ask you guys to think about. Um, and there are lots of us you know, who come from legacy environments. Well, I think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur because unlike 20 years ago, I think every company is worried about disruption. So the complacency is gone. MR and I are old enough to remember a phrase that was common maybe 20 or 25 years ago called, you never got fired for buying IBM. I, Remember right. that? Nobody yep. says that anymore. <laughs> because that was like playing safe. Today, I think companies are, are worried enough that they are much more willing to try new things than they were you know, 20 years ago. So I think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. Doors are more open than they were. Right? People are not as risk averse in large companies as they used to be. Great. Well, I think we can go on and on uh, with these three gentlemen, but I hope you got a glimpse of uh, the fascinating lives and trials and tribulations of three CFOs. I'm really grateful to have all of them as members of our Indiaspora community as well. So a warm round of applause for the three of you.